Yes, Pierre, how's it going? Good, thanks to yourself. Michael, right? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. How are you today? Um, I'm good, thanks. Just disconnect this. I think my... No. No worries. Better. Well, yeah, thank, thanks for coming on. Thanks for your time. Yeah, no, no problem. I mean, I'm, I'm quite flattered to be invited, actually. <laughs> no, it's great to have you on. Um, it's good to meet, I don't know, a, a fellow Bitcoiner and uh, shoot the breeze, as, as we say in Ireland, and see how things are going. Um, so you're, you're based, aren't you based out in Hong Kong? Yeah, I'm, I'm based in Hong Kong. Yeah. Oh, wow. But originally from South Africa. Okay. How'd you end up there? I actually, I moved here to study um so i i did my undergrad here and i've just been working ever since yeah and how do you end up in thailand from ireland the very long story uh <laughs> extremely long i actually i my first kind of uh adventure in asia was living in china which is almost 20 years ago now um so i was i was living in china in wenzhou uh, in Zhejiang province. I, I lived there between 2004 and 2008, I think. So quite okay. a long time ago. Um, but I... Period. Oh. Pardon? Quite an interesting period as well, I guess. Uh, yeah. Ending in 2008, right? Yeah, I think, you know, according to people I've talked to, and, you know, people say that's probably one of the, the, the freest periods that China's ever experienced in its history. <laughs> because, yeah, I, I guess you can argue that. Yeah, I mean, it was under, who was the premier that, Hu Jintao, I think was the premier then. I think that's right. Yeah, it was Hu Jintao, I think. But yeah, yeah it, was, it, it was a cool, it was a really cool place to, you know, when you kind of, uh, you break out in your early 20s and you've got this you know, idealized vision of the world and the difference you're going to make in it, you know, before you become tainted by the inevitability and the, the pointlessness of it all. <laughs> I, I suppose that's the, that's the period I'm in now. So. <laughs> all right. Enjoy, enjoy. Um, it won't last. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hope I can prove you wrong, but. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only joking. I'm only joking. What, so what did you, what did you move uh, to Hong Kong? What did, what did you move there to study? I studied material science and engineering, and I minored in political science as well. So a little bit of a weird combination, I, I guess. Um, but I, I always found it a little bit, a little bit silly to to focus all of my energy on one particular thing that interests me when there's so much in the world that that I can go and learn and experience. So finding that one thing for me is has been a challenge i guess but um i've enjoyed everything i've learned so far so, yeah okay and I, yeah that's actually one of the things i love about bitcoin because it encompasses so much um from the very technical side going all the way to the very social side where you know you have to meet people and you have to have these kind of conversations like here, here is this solution to all of the problems you've been having. Uh, do you want to check it out? And they'll usually rebuff you. So, you know, social skills are very important and uh, having an understanding of all of the different things, the energy sector, the uh, code base itself and properties of money, uh, the history of it. Yeah. So uh, that's part of what drew me to Bitcoin initially, I think. Yeah, yeah. I think they're... It, it's it, it's difficult to remember life before Bitcoin, I think. Um, it was a, you know, it was a kind of a, a much, much more, kind of more peaceful, a more tranquil existence. You had more head space. Um, somewhat, I think, I don't know, you know, life, life in Bitcoin is this kind of this chaotic, but, you know, yet deeply fascinating, never ending, kind of evolving uh I don't know what it is. It's just, it's, it's kind of all consuming idea. Um, but mm -hmm. you meet, I don't know, like I've, I've just met, I've met some really cool people um, through Bitcoin. And in fact, last night I, I run a meetup, a Bitcoin meetup here in Phuket. Um, it's the Bitcoin powerhouse uh, meetup. And we had one last night, actually. Um, it was quite cool. We did a, a oh, nice. Bitcoin 101. Like, so we went through some of the fundamental, 
fundamental ideas of Bitcoin, you know, what is Bitcoin, what is money, uh, what is decentralization, this type of thing. And we had at the meetup, there were about 15 people there, which is which is pretty good. Um, but we had four people who were completely new to Bitcoin. Like they just knew the name Bitcoin. That was it. So we did it like a, we did this kind of a rotating, uh, ro we rotated seats and tables and then kind of discussed these I these central ideas uh, at our tables. And it was, it, it, was, it was such a cool, such a cool opportunity, you know, to kind of go back to the basics to try and explain these things to you know, someone who was so wet behind the ears, um, but it was oh, it was a really cool experience. It was enjoyable. Do you have anything like that in Hong Kong? Or so, we were actually at the same conference um, in Bali not too long ago, um, and there, to my to my major surprise, I met quite a lot of people from Hong Kong that are part of, uh, I guess, the ecosystem in Hong Kong for Bitcoin. And there is a meetup here. Uh, usually about once a month and I still haven't, I still haven't gone since uh, October when I found out about it. So I've, I've missed two. Um, but yeah, I, unfortunately I've always found Hong Kong to be one of the most fiat centric cities in the world. I mean, most of the economy here is based off of the banking and shipping sectors. So uh, yeah, I always felt a little bit isolated um, in that regard. I mean, I, I live with two Bitcoiners at the moment, which is quite nice. So there's always someone to talk talk to in person. But other than that, yeah, I, the few people I've met are quite scattered across Hong Kong. So, okay, unfortunate. And is 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 Bitcoin something? Uh, you know, I I see Hong Kong kind of trying to position itself as you know, kind of like a crypto capital of of that part of the world. Um. Why? Why do you think? Why do you think it's? Uh, well, how would you describe Bitcoin adoption or Bitcoin awareness in Hong Kong, and um, with all that going on? So, I think I think Hong Kong is unfortunately very much geared towards the the Web three and NFT type uh, craze that was going on a few years ago. Uh, I think. As with any regulatory body, it takes quite a while for them to, you know, get into gear and actually figure something out. So they made all of this legislation, which, which it does, it does open the opportunities to build with Bitcoin. I mean, I am trying to build with Bitcoin as much as I can. Well, here I've I've got a couple of business ideas that have been in the works for a little bit too long, um, but. Yeah, so so they're pretty open to the adoption of Bitcoin, which is nice. But then most people, they would hold a bunch of cryptos, um, a bunch of decentralized and name only tokens, really. Um, so yeah, it's it's been a little bit sad on that front for me, um, considering, I mean, Hong Kong is one of the richest cities in the world. Every one in seven people here is a dollar millionaire. Um, so there's quite a lot of people that would be able to put in significant amounts of their wealth into Bitcoin without, you know, even taking a major risk as uh, as people still view Bitcoin in most parts of the world. Mm. And in, in, in your opinion, then, Pierre, why do you think why do you think more of these super rich people are not allocating more or, or, or maybe some of them? I'm sure some of them are. But why do you think it? the kind of adoption then is so slow when the risk reward is so, is so good? Well, that is the thing. I think there is still this whole chokehold that, that media outlets and now major social media outlets as well have on people and what, what you are shown and what you're taught. Um, I think it's a old Noam Chomsky book, uh, Manufacturing Consent. Mm. which expresses the the sentiment essentially that you know in order to get your people ready to go to war for your country that kind of thing you kind of have to blast them with these ideas the whole time like oh the war is good or something and i think it's very clear if you look at new york times headlines or many of these um media outlets if you look at what they say about bitcoin compared to the stark reality of it i mean the fact that it saved 
myself and my family from major debasement. Uh, it saved many Africans and many other people from the global south from serious, serious issues with their local currencies. I, I, I seriously, I, I don't think that people are really giving Bitcoin a, a fair chance in terms of looking at it for themselves. They're, they're just very happy to take the word of any old person that sits behind a camera um, for CNN, or Fox or whoever it may be, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, even just hearing CNN, the words or the acronym CNN, CNN and Fox, I felt my stomach twitch a little bit and oh, a kind of gag reflex kicked in there. Um, <laughs> I, I actually, I don't know how anyone can watch that that type of thing anymore. It just seems, it seems so archaic in many ways, just with the, you know, just the vast array of information and quality information that you can, you can find online. Um, it just seems yeah. bizarre that you would want to inter even entertain the ideas that they're presenting because they're, they're obviously just propaganda nonsense and, uh, but still people do. <laughs> I mean, let's be real, right? Throughout, Throughout the last few decades, the news has has presented some very important information. There's there's no denying that, but I just think that this whole notion of trying to attack people for doing their own research and things like that is quite, for me, it's quite antithetical to what I believe in. I, I think you know everyone should try and figure out. The world as much as they can comprehend it and they should go and you know create value with that understanding of the world right and if you're being forced to only think in one way well not forced but if you're being strongly encouraged by gunpoint to only think in one way then of course you won't have a society that has multifaceted different parts to it that can you know come together and form a good division of labor so yeah, I, I don't understand that whole that whole system that, that's been developing and how it has lasted so long. But hopefully with the rise of stuff like Noster that I know you're a fan of, um, hopefully it will start becoming less and less uh, part of everyday life. I mean, I know most, most of my friends and most of the people around my age, very few of them go down and sit, sit at the television and, and watch the news as they would once. Though I, I guess a lot of them have the apps on their phones and stuff like that. Yeah. Well, you, you mentioned before there that um, just that idea of the kind of, I suppose, engaging with uh, the leg legacy media system. You said it was kind of antithetical to the world that you believe in. Um, can you kind of, yeah. out what can you outline what is the world then that you believe in, if that's the case? <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, typically the easiest way to just go about it is to explain to people that I'm a libertarian or an anarcho-capitalist. But I mean, I fundamentally don't believe that everyone should also be forced into a capitalist system if they don't want to be, of course. I, I guess it is just a, a voluntarist system. You know, if you want to go live in a commune somewhere and, you know, share everything uh, in that particular way and somehow make it work, go for it it's, it's not my business really um I, I just believe in a system where everyone should be able to provide as much value as as they can and gain as much value as they can from that as well um just free voluntary interaction between people in whichever way that happens to take place organically i don't think there should be someone that you know tries to push you into oh you should uh you should go and do this because we want it that way. Um, yeah. Yeah. Especially, I was, I read, when was it yesterday or the day before? I don't know if you know that uh, Rothbard essay called The Free Market. Um, I have a one. printed copy here, but I still haven't read it. Actually. <laughs> well, it's, it's really worth reading. And uh, it's it's short enough for someone as stupid as me and with such a low attention span to actually get through it in one go, which uh, is remarkable. Um, but in there, in there, he he talks about how 
you know, in terms of like a, a like a libertarian society or an anarcho-capitalist society, let's say, where people would come along and say something like, oh, it's dog eat dog. It's, you know, everyone's just, you know, flinging shit at each other and trying to rip each other off. And, you know, we can't have some you know, war of every man against every man. It's just not the way the world should be. So people say that attacking kind of anarcho-capitalist ideas or the system, you know, the, the system that would would uh, grow out of that that idea. However, at the same time, uh, people are happy living in a system where the government steals their money through taxation and inflation. So you have a system of theft, active theft. But at the same time, you also have countries going to war with each other and using taxpayers' money. So you also have murder on the cards. So Rothbard kind yeah. of says, you know, which do you think, you know, how can you, how can you uh, agree with living in a system that is, uh, you know, there's, there's legalized murder and theft, but yet think some, you know, people doing business with, with each other on a kind of voluntary basis is, is some kind of evil. Um, now, I paraphrase that terribly, but I'm sure I'm sure you'd agree with some of those things, you, would you? Yeah, you got the sentiment across quite well, I, I, I think, from what I've read of Rothbard um, in general. Um, but yeah, no, I, I tend to agree with that that entirely. I I think I tweeted a couple of days ago, actually, something very much along the same lines um, about the whole um, when you are using fiat in general, you are helping to prop up the complete well theft from other people as as your money in the bank is used for the endless credit expansion as well. And then, of course, also for wars and for all the other vile activities that we don't even know about that various governments around the world are, are doing. So, yeah, I, I very much agree with that that sentiment. But I actually wanted to comment on um, your point, your brief statement earlier about your attention span. And that's actually something I find particularly interesting. And I've, I've started writing quite a lot of um, passages about it. Um, and I, I eventually want to turn it into a book, but unfortunately, my attention span is not great either. <laughs> but um, my my friend and I started working on this Netflix hypothesis, is what we what we called it, and it's essentially just this idea that an inflationary monetary environment, of course, that affects people's time preference. They you know they want to spend more and more because whether they know it or not, or whether they consciously think about it or not, they know that if they can get something now, it is better than waiting a couple of months down the line and then being able to afford less, right? But what that does in turn is it may, makes companies as well try to build their business model around the way people start thinking, right? So a business like Netflix, like jewel or any of these other vape companies or most social media today it's all about trying to get that rapid dopamine spike to keep you consuming endlessly you know i'm going to drop an entire series uh, season of a series in one go so you can sit and watch it through instead of you know having that that patience to wait for the next one i'm you're no longer going to have to step outside to smoke a cigarette now you can just hit a vape in class or whatever it may be Right. And I, I do seriously think that there is a very direct relation to the complete debasement of our monies that is is very much linked to to this thing with people scrolling on TikTok, on Instagram Reels or whatever. And I mean, people can't sit and focus on a conversation. Um, they can't read a book. It's for me, I think it's a very scary thing. And I mean, I'm part of it, of course. I, I fall part of that problem and most people in my generation I I think do as well. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. The you know, when was the, when was the last time you saw someone sit, sitting reading like a a hard copy of a book in public? It doesn't happen that often anymore. In in Hong Kong, I don't think I've ever seen that uh, <laughs> for the five years I've been here. Yeah. Um I actually make a point. I'm I'm a little bit. I wouldn't say I'm a traditionalist in any way, but I just I just value the attention span that I've got left. <laughs> so 
every morning when I get up, every morning I will I'll at least read for 30 minutes. And when I go to bed, I'll at least read for 30 minutes. And I very often I very often read fiction, actually. I'm a big fan of um Dostoevsky, uh Gogol, okay. um, who else? Schultz Ganichkin, although that's not pronounced correctly. Uh, and some of the some of the classic Russian writers. I really like like things like Dickens as well. Um, and just classics in general. Um, I find that they kind of they just they soothe the mind. Uh, they gen it helps you generate ideas. It helps you kind of yeah. And it just feels good to be engaged in some kind of linear uh, thought process instead of that you know kind of scattered mind that we have all day. You know, your mind just feels like it's in a million pieces, like throwing a hundred M and M's onto the floor, and that that's your thoughts going in all directions. I don't know. Do 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 you? take take part in some kind of habitual forced reading to keep you in the game or is it are you just spontaneous are you just different to that completely i mean i'm a big audiobook fan um but that's mostly because i can't you know stack books in piles in my house right uh punk on apartments are not very big <laughs> so <laughs> i i've I've been very taken by, well, Audible. So every day on my commute to work, I listen to an uh, an audiobook and then on my way back as well. Um, and then over my lunch break and stuff like that, um, deep in the fiat mines. Um, yeah, so I, I tend to mostly work towards, I mean, I use audiobooks as my habitual reading as you said but mm. i mean my laptop is currently sitting on a, a copy of human action and the theory of money and credit by von mises which i hope to get through both of them this year as well but yeah um there is definitely i think a a necessity to calm your mind and sort of focus on just one thing for a while and I haven't gotten too much into it myself. I think I was always put off by the, you know, wishy-washy mysticism of it. Um, but just meditation in general. Uh, lately, I've been trying to wake up and meditate for, you know, 15, 20 minutes or something, have a cup of tea, and then, you know, get ready for work. Um, just so that I can, you know, ground myself and, you know, train my mind in in the ability just to focus at least yeah. um, not, to, not to mention all the other benefits that meditation reportedly has but yeah sure. so reading and meditation um and just a few routines i do i do quite enjoy otherwise you know i'd be running off and you know doing any old thing and never being able to focus on one thing never be able to get my life together so yeah yeah the I just the, the image when you when you said I'd never be able to get anything done. This this image just popped into my head of someone, just a guy lying on the sofa, not you, but just a guy lying on the sofa, barely dressed for the day, maybe wearing the same clothes the day before, scrolling for the like the sixteenth hour in a row on TikTok while watching a series on Netflix and eating a big bag of potato crisps. That's that's what we're that's that's where we're going that's where we're headed at the moment you know people are losing yes. their mind with this stuff um netflix on two times speed though right pardon netflix on two times speed yeah of course because you yeah it's just not 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 you just don't get enough at normal speed um, <laughs> um another I thing i actually know someone that does pretty much exactly that every day Serious. yeah Serious. so i mean Madness. she's a she Okay. <laughs> um, when you mention meditation, actually, <clears throat> I've gotten, I've for many, many, many years, I've been a fan of Sam Harris. Do you know him? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah I, I don't. I haven't gotten too in depth with Sam Harris and his ideas in particular, but I have. Um, I mean, the waking up app uh, of his. 
Mm. And I do, I do quite en uh, enjoy it. And I like some of the talks by like Alan Watts and a couple of other people. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so I, yeah, I, I'm not too familiar with engaging in particularly Sam Harris's ideas, mm. but otherwise like I find his app and his guided meditation quite useful for me. Yeah, it's good. That, in fact, that's, that's the only app I have on my phone that I pay for a subscription to the waking up. The the courses are brilliant, and there's a really good. I I can recommend a course on it. There's one about uh, stoicism, and like stoic meditation, and I forget the name of the guy who who presents it, but he's you know an expert like forty years as a stoic or something like that, and it takes you through these different uh, kind of visualization techniques and types of stoic meditation that are they're very different, but again, it just gives you it gives you more 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 tools i think to play with um when it comes to kind of settling the mind or uh recalibrating the mind so to speak yeah i i think there's also something to be said for the help that it, that it potentially gives to people um that are you know getting on in years and are worried about slipping into dementia alzheimer's and that kind of thing i mean my parents are you know, not not very young compared to, I mean, I'm 24, my dad is 65. Um, so, you know, like, he, he just retired and now he's, I don't have work to go to every day. You know, what do I do? So I started recommending that he, you know, starts learning how to meditate and start practicing, see if, see if it works for him. Because I, it would be very sad for me to, to go through what my mother's going through with her mother. Um, with a parent that slips into to dementia and well alzheimer's really it's the actual cause but yeah 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 i i i always recommend to people um on on the sam harris uh waking up app there's there's something called the the introductory course the introductory med meditation and it's like 60 but maybe 60 lessons and in that you know it takes you through pretty much every technique that he knows anyway. Um, and I, I find that very, very useful, especially during the COVID time when there was lockdowns and everything. I find myself sitting out in the garden. I've got like a little, in, in Thai, it's called a sala. It's like a wooden house in the garden. And I find myself uh, in there going through that med that meditation course. And it was very helpful. Highly recommend it. Um, I'm, okay. I, I've, done, I've done that introductory course as well and I, I did quite enjoy it as as well but I Good. yeah I stopped for a little while and now I'm trying to get back into it so yeah. it's it's always a thing it's it's constant effort and constant practice which you know something as an adult you you have to get used to it's a part of life right exactly exactly no it's 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 very very interesting and just just how how much you realize that you are asleep pretty much most of the day, you know, like even, even like little silly things where you know, you're sitting at a red light and then you suddenly, you know, have five or six breaths and you go, right, I'm at the traffic lights here, you know, whereas previously you can, you know, drive for 30 minutes and you, you don't even know how you got home. Um, <laughs> Yeah, no, sometimes you just live on autopilot and it's a bit, it's a bit scary actually that, you know, you waste quite a lot of your day away, not, not thinking about all the little things. And I think before I was even introduced to mindfulness or meditation of any kind, um, I'd always lived my life by a very loose motto that is, you know, don't worry about the, the bigger things, but appreciate the little ones. You know, uh, appreciate the very little things, and then the big things you can't control. I mean, why worry about it? It's not, it's not something you you can change. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So just to kind of shift gears yeah. slightly here, what are you excited about in Bitcoin at the moment? And uh, what's what's caught your attention? What are you focusing on? Where are the bright lights shining for you? So I mean, obviously, everyone's talking about the ETF. Um, and Gary Gensler's uh, SEC mess up yesterday with the tweet. Brilliant. Um, and I mean, obviously, there's the halving coming up. And yeah, uh, I think everyone in general is quite quite bullish at the moment. Um, well, everyone 
in Bitcoin, of course, is quite bullish on it at the moment. And I had a phone call with my dad last night um, and he was quite worried um, because he also is a Bitcoiner to varying degrees. I mean, I help him with some of the things, but he he's quite worried because he's he obviously is worried about uh, ETF price manipulation. If the ETF gets rejected and the price plummets, you know, how long will it take to recover? He, he's retired and he needs spending power now rather than later. So, yeah, I I think for me what what I'm what I'm excited by is just the fact that sooner or later people are going to have to realize that there is nothing better. Uh, if if my dad had kept his money in South Africa, he would have been debased by what at least forty percent over the last two three years. Um, if he tried to move it into U.S. stock market, you know, he probably still would have underperformed. Um, I I just I can't find anything else that is somewhat as good of a money within, I mean, within the world today. I, I think Bitcoin is the only solution for most people that just want to save. And of course, if you want to go in and invest and, you know, try and build a company that that does something useful, great. That that is something people should do. But yeah, I, I'm I'm just very bullish on the fact that it can help so many people from the developing world escape terrible capital controls and financial systems. And the other thing is I'm always quite focused on the energy market for Bitcoin. I think energy is the lifeblood of any economy throughout history. Um, and the way in which people are engaging with Bitcoin mining, um, you know, there's, I think it's gridless compute uh, that operate across Africa. They're setting up various different hydro systems primarily and providing access to energy to people that have previously not had any i think that that's going to be a huge game changer for people and people are going to start realizing listen this is a big force something is changing here mm. okay cool um so we haven't got a ton of time left so kind of, i wanted to kind of you know switch things about a, a little bit again um if i had to put you on the spot and say give me your top three books of all time uh they don't have to be Bitcoin related. It can be anything fiction, nonfiction. What what three books would make that list? Do you think, and why? Um. So for me, I'm just going to start with the very cliche, "The Sovereign Individual" uh, by James Dale Davidson and Lord William Rees Mogg. Uh, I think that's just because for me, it consolidated a lot of my ideas and it gave a bit of more, a bit more history to the way I thought and a bit a bit more structured to how how everything could potentially work. Um, so there's that. And then another one uh, is Atlas Shrugged, Ayn Rand, of course. Uh, I know Ayn Rand is obviously very con controversial with her ideas, and I don't agree with everything she says, naturally. Um, but I do just think that that whole sentiment of loving the good for being the good. And the idea that just simply, you know, the producers of a society are who are important. The people that are leeching off of their backs, there is no justification for that leeching. I think everyone should, you know, take their own lives into their own hands uh, where, wherever possible. And I do also believe in the institution of charity as a, a widespread force for helping those that that grew up or grow up in worse situations right and the third one is a little bit tricky i'm thinking a little bit about all of the great books i've read in the last few years um strangely enough i think it's uh, a book by mark skousen uh, it's it's free on well it's free with a audible subscription um but the big three in economics, um, basically it just goes through a history of different 
economic histories um, from Karl Marx, John Maynard Keynes, and um, Adam Smith. And I think it does a, a very good job at just, you know, painting how each of these ideologies became so widespread and what these ideologies actually are without without being, you know, very difficult to consume for the average reader. Um, and I, I, I haven't actually read too much into Mark Skousen, but I, he seems to paint uh, a more Austrian economics ideal, and he seems to point to the fact that Austrian economists had been answering all of these texts for a very long time, but they had the disadvantage of primarily writing in German, so they weren't as well widespread. And yeah, so I think I think that those for me are probably the best three books that, or most important three books I've read in the last few years. Fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. I've, I haven't got round to reading Atlas Shrugged yet. Um, I did look at the audio book and I think it was like 60 or 65 hours or something. <laughs> yeah, it's very long. <laughs> but I will. I will. Okay. Yes. But it's worth it. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, okay. Uh, just, I suppose, before we head off, uh, quick question. Why haven't you updated your, your st sub stack in a while? Yeah, so... I've I do read deep, it. So, <laughs> been deep in the fiat mines, unfortunately, and I'm also a little bit worried about the national security law in Hong Kong. Mm. Uh, there are some things I can and cannot say. Um, and yeah, no, I'm I'm thinking about you know getting a pseudonym and starting from scratch and writing writing from that name um, rather than continuing my own name just for fear of uh, physical harm to myself but yeah I, i've been i've been a bit distracted unfortunately um been a bit busy and and trying to think and consolidate my ideas because really I, I want to write a book more than just do the sub stack but yeah it's a valid criticism and i i was actually writing a piece today to post and i realized there would probably be something you would ask <laughs> there we go Okay, Pierre, it's been a great pleasure. Thank you for your time. Um, and if you, we don't live that far apart in terms of the, the big bad world. So if you're ever in Phuket for a bit of sun and uh, pineapple juice or whatever, um, please hit me up on, preferably on, I'm on Noster. I'm not really on Twitter that much anymore. I try to, I don't know, I, I feel better when I'm not on Twitter, uh, to be honest. Um, but yeah, yeah anytime. But yeah, no, it, it sounds great. Uh, also, if you're in Hong Kong, please uh, shoot me a message. Nostra works fine for me. Cool. Um, Will do. Yeah. Man. Thank you. All right. Well, have a good day. Thanks for your time. Bye-bye. As well. Bye-bye. Cheers.